Amen. We're doing the power of kingdom leadership, part two. The power of kingdom leadership, part two. I trust that those of you viewing by streaming will stay with us for just a few more minutes while we share this word from the Lord. A couple of weeks ago, James Keyes was driving me. We left a meeting that was later than planned. It was late at night. Had been a very long day. Keys was driving. We were on I-45 north near North Main. The traffic suddenly stopped. When I looked to see what had caused the traffic to stop that late at night, it was a wreck. In fact, it was a motorcycle crash, and there was a lifeless, motionless body laying on the concrete. Without thinking much about my own safety, I said to Keys, stop the car. I've got to check on this person. And Keys was trying to tell me to be careful, but my thoughts were not really about my own safety. My thoughts were, I've got to rush to see if I can help this man who's lying on the ground in a pool of blood wearing a motorcycle helmet. I rushed there and there was no police there yet, no ambulance, no paramedics, only a few people uh, because it had just occurred. And I said, has 911 been called? Someone had called 911, nothing had happened. I called 911 again. And uh, while I was on the phone with 911, what I did not anticipate were the instructions that I would receive, and that is you've got to perform a CPR. There on the concrete on I-545 North, I was pounding the chest of the man at the instruction of the dispatch person trying to see if there could be a response to my dismay. There was not one. He was already deceased. I don't know if you've ever been to a situation like that or not. It's ghastly. It's difficult to bear. When the paramedics arrived, I was there kneeling at the man's side, still trying to see if something could come of it. They ordered me to step back, and I did. And I began to talk to the first person at the scene who actually saw the incident, and she described what had happened. A group of motorcycles were traveling at very, very high speeds, going in and out of the traffic on the freeway and he lost control and the crash occurred. As I thought to myself, how often that occurs, the zigzagging out of traffic at high rates of speed, I thought to myself, why didn't he know better? Why didn't he know better? His family is going to have to hear that this is how he ended his life and then I thought where are the other motorcycles and then it made me wonder who was he following who was he trying to keep up with when he died Did they even notice that the man who was following them had lost his life? The moral is be careful who you follow. All of us are leading somebody. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your station in life. Somebody is following you. And that is because all of us were created, according to Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, we're all created in God's image and in God's likeness with built-in attributes for dominion. 
that's in your DNA. Created in his image and in his likeness. And so God then says, let them have dominion. God would not have given you a dominion assignment without dominion attributes. And because you have dominion attributes, you are made to lead. Leadership has been defined as influence, the ability to influence other people and places, which means that because you walk around every day with that influence, you and I are influencing people to act certain ways, do certain things. We influence the places where we show up. Believe it or not, though you don't have a sanctuary title, somebody has been influenced by you in here today. That's why when one person claps, other people clap. Have you ever noticed that in an audience of people, it can be quiet, but if one person starts to clap at a performance, somebody else claps. If somebody stands, somebody else tends to stand. And if one person sits down, all of a sudden, other people start sitting down. That's because all of us possess a measure of influence. Somebody is frowning because you won't smile. So, so, somebody is having a bad church experience because you look like you're miserable. And they glanced at you and caught your spirit. Because all of us are born with a measure of influence because you are a leader by design. By design. Dominion is leadership. Dominion is leadership. I wish you would tell us about dominion is leadership. Dominion is leadership. Don't mean it's leadership. And you were sent into the world created by God to have dominion. That means to influence, to govern, to rule, to influence. Now, I want to tell you a few things about yourself that you might not have been taught. Because if you have leadership influence and don't know it, you're probably going to misuse it or underuse it. And I know for a fact that everyone here has underused our influence, our leadership. And others of us, including myself, have at times misused our influence. Your leadership has not always been used in the best ways. Oh, you are a, a leader. And the reason God did that was so that each one of us, brothers and sisters, could advance his agenda on earth in whatever place and station we are assigned. It doesn't matter who you are, God built you in such a way that you could advance his agenda on earth wherever you are stationed, wherever you are assigned. Oh, God. I, I know this may be real deep, but it ain't. It may sound like it, but it's, it's just fundamental. It's just that we were not introduced to ourselves properly. And so most of us feel no accountability 
no responsibility because you don't know how powerful you really are. You, you, you don't realize how major you really are. You, you have no, 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 no understanding as to how absolutely powerful you are by design. And so you've been taught to take care of your life, your business, handle your stuff, and you ain't got nothing to do with nobody else. That's a lie. You've been told, go to school, pay, get you a job, pay your bills, take care of your life, and everybody else ain't got nothing to do. That's a lie. You've been told that as long as you obey the law, you don't get in trouble, you stay to yourself, mind your business, you know, close your door, lock it at night. You did your part. That's a lie. God did not give you dominion and capacity for that. God gave each one of us dominion attributes and he puts you in places and stations in order for it to become something that it would not be without you. That's called leadership. Oh, God. I said that's called leadership. You can't write this fast. It's meant to say amen back to me. Listen to the tape later and then take your notes. Right now, you got to really look at me out of eye to get this. I'm, I'm trying to say to you that you got leadership capacity that you can be irresponsible with because you don't know how to use it. Or you can be completely oblivious to it and completely underestimate who you are purposed to be. Uh, so then, so then, whether your station is in a house with a family, in a marriage with a wife, in a classroom as a teacher, as a, as a school as a principal, you know, a, a nurse in a hospital, a doctor with a staff, you know, a supervisor, a, a division leader, a department head, a, a, a manager, you know, the, the civic club leader, the, the, the neighbor who lives on a certain street. The mayor, the city councilman, the congresswoman, the fireman, the, it, it, it doesn't matter where you are, wherever your station is, you are assigned there to show influence that causes things to happen that would not have happened had you not been there. And the thing that you're supposed to be making happen is the kingdom agenda in the fire station, in the classroom, in the school, in the hospital, on your shift, on your job, in your department, in your neighborhood, on your street, in the civics club. This is, it's a hard crowd. It's a hard crowd. I'm, I promise I'm gonna preach this somewhere else. They're gonna be shouting right now. They're gonna be shouting me down because revelation ought to cause a celebration. I said revelation ought to cause some celebration. Would, would you tell yourself, listen, you, you're not just a choir member. You are a leader in the choir. You say, but I'm not the music director, but you're an alto. And if you sing alto right, you'll help somebody else to sing it better. See, see you're not just a choir member. You, you are a soprano in the soprano section that's inspiring other sopranos to sing their best for the glory of God. That's why you, you got to show up on time. You got to be smiling. You got to be punctual and positive. You got to be professional because you're inspiring somebody. There was somebody in the audience today who can't stand to look at Vanessa, but they want to look at you. There's somebody else in the audience who can't stand to look at you, but they're looking at Vanessa. And so you're leading somebody in the audience from where you stand. That's why you ought to look like you're happy to be there. See, some, you're leading right now on your role. Your response right now, you're leading somebody to either act like this is interesting or act like this is the most boring thing you've ever heard and you're influencing somebody else not to even hear the gospel. Some of y'all look like you can't wait to get out of church. Leave! Go! Go right now! Because we don't need your influence in here. That's why mad folk don't leave church. Why else would you stay? You mad don't want to be a while. Why you stay? 
you stay because you want to influence somebody else to have your attitude. I mean, why else would you stay somewhere you don't want to be? If I was through, I'd just drop the mic. I'm, 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 so I'm trying to say to us, God created each of us to be influencers. So when you stay at home from church, guess what you're doing? Influencing somebody else to stay at home from church. You can't encourage other folk to go worship if you don't. You can't influence me to pray if you don't pray. You can't influence me to give if you don't give. You can't influence me to serve if you don't serve. So our influence either works for God's kingdom or against God's kingdom. Every day, somewhere, somebody is influenced by me for God or against God. And the same is true for you. That's why I can't wallow in my problems. That's why I can't allow myself to drown in my depression. Because as long as I stay down, I can't lift you. I'm going to pull somebody else down with me the longer I stay down. Come on, tell somebody, you are a leader. And in your life's assignment, you are influencing something or somebody all the time. A family, a team, a club, a community, a business, a staff, a department, a section, a band, a gang. We're all leaders. The question is, Am I God's leader? Or am I the world's leader? Am I building God's kingdom with my leadership? Or am I building Satan's kingdom with my leadership? So God made man to be leaders. That's why Adam and Eve had dominion power. Leadership. Satan saw that leadership. And said, I'm going to hijack that. Because if they operate according to kingdom leadership assignment, they're going to multiply and subdue the earth. So everywhere they show up and their kind shows up, the leadership of God will show up and God will establish his kingdom through their leadership. <laughs> will you tell you, but this ain't fifth grade Sunday school class here now. God says, I gave them dominion, which is leadership power. Be fruitful and multiply was the assignment. Subdue the earth. That means take over it. Cause the earth to become what I purpose it to be. Satan says, I got to stop it now. So he hijacks it through his subtle scheming, deceitful ways. So that Adam would now produce outcomes that didn't look like God, but look like the devil. That's what sin does. So before Adam sinned, the dog wouldn't have bit him. The cow wouldn't growl, the, 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 the tiger wouldn't growl at Adam. The lion wouldn't bite him. Rose bushes didn't have thorns. Because when God's kingdom order is in operation, it does not bring pain, sickness, disease, arguments, fussing, fighting, and wars. It brings peace, love, harmony, joy. Somebody about to catch this in a minute.
So, God is love. Do we all agree on that? So his kingdom is a kingdom that operates on the principles of love. Now, so if we were operating still on God's kingdom principles and leading that way, then we re reproduce love by our actions. True love, not my man-made love, God's love, right? Because God's kingdom is his governing agency that operates on his principles, laws, and values. So a kingdom leader is a person who submits themselves to God, surrenders their will to God, operates on the principles, laws, and values of God in order to bring what God's purpose to an atmosphere and environment through the lives of people. That's what a kingdom leader is. Are you getting this? Now, 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 brothers and sisters, I will submit to you that everywhere you see disaster, everywhere you see disease, everywhere you see man in conflict with man, everywhere you see racism, everywhere you see strife, everywhere you see violence, everywhere you see, you're just looking at what Satan's kingdom brings. All of that is evidence of the kingdom of Satan. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, uh, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, the king of kings, have come that you might have what? Come on, shout, life, and life more uh, abundantly. So wherever I am as a kingdom leader, I'm supposed to be operating on kingdom values, principles, and laws in order to reproduce God's love and life wherever I'm leading. That's my assignment. So if I'm on a job and I got co-workers fighting each other over race, I'm supposed to jump in the middle. Because I represent the kingdom of life and love that, 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 that does not facilitate racism. So I can't be cracking white jokes and, 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 and Asian jokes on the job because I'm a kingdom leader. I teach people mutual respect. I can't, I can't participate in the gay jokes that demean people. Because even though God's word may disagree with somebody's lifestyle, God still loves the person. So, so I, can't, I can't get off on that. I got to say, no, you got to love them. I don't care what they do. You, you can't demean their humanity. Because I'm a kingdom leader. I submit to you that if we don't raise up more kingdom leaders, we're going to continue to see more disaster, more broken homes, more destroyed families, more, more, more pain, more death, and more destruction in our communities, in our schools. Everywhere you go, it'll be disaster. Three things I'm done. Here are three questions we need to ask today and answer. One, what is the definition of kingdom leadership? What's kingdom leadership definition? What's the, how's it defined? Two, two. What is kingdom leadership's difference? What, what is the difference? And then three, what is my kingdom leadership decision? That's it. How is it defined? Kingdom leadership. And I love this definition shared. Yes. It's a kingdom leadership. 
Casey Brewer says, the kingdom leader is wholly submitted to God, called and appointed by God, and equipped and empowered by God to fulfill the station of influence and authority to which they have been appointed. Which means, I can't be a leader where I'm not assigned. A kingdom leader fulfills the station, fulfills the station of influence and authority to which they have been appointed. See, you can't be a kingdom leader in territory you wasn't given by God. Like, I can't be the king, kingdom leader at your house. When I come to your house, you're the leader. That's your territory. Okay, let me get clear to that. Your daughter can't be the kingdom leader at your house. That's not her assignment. That's yours. And a lot of us have turned the house over to the child. Abdicating our kingdom authority. That's your assignment. I can't go to City Hall and be the bishop in charge. That's not my assignment. The mayor is there. I can't choose my place of assignment. I go where I'm sent. Stationed by God. You see? You can't just make yourself a husband because you want to be one. You can't do that. That's an assigned station by God. And whatever he assigns you to, he gave you the attributes to do it with. So if I don't have the attributes to be a mother, I can't be a mama. God didn't make me the mayor. I can't be the mayor. I look like down there arguing with the mayor like I'm the mayor. I have to know my assignment. A deacon can be a really great deacon here, but you can't be the pastor. You should only talk so much. Some of y'all are over talking. Because you're in the wrong position talking too much. You can't go to the school and talk more than the principal. Okay, I'm getting too deep. I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to say to you that kingdom leaders understand assignment. God never gives you authority without where he's not assigned you. And kingdom leadership, brothers and sisters, is not about vain glory. It's about operating in such a way that you bring God glory through the accomplishment of his own kingdom agenda. Kingdom leaders accept God's authority. Kingdom leaders accept and honor God's kingdom assignments. And you are not in charge. God is in charge. I'm not in charge of me. I have to answer to him. Number two, what is the kingdom leadership difference? Well, kingdom leaders understand that God's kingdom is an expression of God's nature. It's his governing authority. It establishes its culture in a territory based on his laws, principles, and values. See, wherever the kingdom is operating, God's 
kingdom culture is established. Come on, say culture. Say it again, culture. If I'm operating a kingdom family, then my family begins to take on God's culture. The goal of a kingdom family leader is to establish a culture of God in the house. Does that make sense? Because it's for the king. It can't be the king's house without the king's culture. So what kind of language will you use? Got quiet, didn't it? We are at the house to establish the king's culture. So imagine the king saying, sit your black sons on down. Y'all not, come on, say that's not the culture. I, I'm trying to say to us, often we give ourselves a pass because we don't know our assignment. My assignment is to establish the king's culture. Wherever I'm assigned. I hate you. I can't stand you. Get him a Imagine the king saying that. It's not his character. It's not his culture. If your boss talked to you like that on your job, you file a lawsuit. Because God corrects us without demeaning us. Oh, I wish I had 10 people here. Come on, God didn't have to tear you down to correct you. That's why kingdom leadership makes a difference. Satan's kingdom is completely different. He'll cuss you out, call you all kind of names, spit you out, make you feel like you should never live again. Because Satan is about what? Death and destruction. He wants to steal your self-esteem and wants you with complete, completely inferior, demean you, and have, because that's how the devil operates. See the difference? Okay. I'm, and we give ourselves a pass, don't we? Shouldn't have made me mad. In God's kingdom, he says, be angry and sin. Be angry at what? No, don't, 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 get, don't, get, don't get mute on me now. Be angry and do what? Sin not. Now, how many of us have gotten angry and sinned in anger? Come on, shout. I wasn't leading for God in that moment. I was representing another kingdom. Now, here's my point. Whenever you practice a sin, it becomes a sin habit. Habit is the root word of habitual. It is also the relative word of habitation. So any sin habit I develop becomes a sin habitation. Oh, God. I, I, I'm almost done. Thank you, man, for helping me. I need about 15 folk here who are going to help me preach this. I can hurry and finish. It is... Any sin habit I establish becomes a sin habitation. Now, you've heard the phrase, of course, about a stronghold. Come on, say a stronghold. All right. So Satan works through establishing strongholds. And if you read that passage, it's the stronghold is in your mind. Now, how does that happen? How does Satan establish a stronghold in your mind and you're a Christian? Here it is. 
Because the more you practice a sin habit, watch this now, sin habits become portals for demonic residents to set up a habitation in your mind. Okay, okay. Sin habits are portals, open passageways for demons to set up habitation in your mind. The picture of a stronghold is a military fort. Okay, y'all watch Cowboys and Indians sometimes, Westerns. Okay, you see the fort with the, with the, with, with the cavalry up, up on a deal? That's called a stronghold. Because the, the soldiers are there to defend that fort against opposition. So when you've got a demonic stronghold, that means you've given demons such access to habitate your mind that they now defend their space in your mind. So in your mind, you got demons in your mind that are set up a stronghold. So anytime you hear truth, the demons say, we ain't receiving that. Somebody asks you forgiveness, I ain't forgiving that. Because the demons in the stronghold saying, we don't do forgiveness. We hold grudges here. We don't give a soft answer, we cuss you back out. Because they got a stronghold in my mind. Sexually, I can't see a woman as God's holy creation with a body that's a temple. I see you as a sex object. I got to have you. Because the demons in my mind tell me that. They set up a stronghold that I can't see you as a holy sacred vessel of God. I only see you as the demons inform me. So if you stayed mad for six months, you got a stronghold. And you still blaming the other person. Because <laughs> habit becomes a what? Comes a habitation. You can't maintain a habit without a spirit to support it. Now that was time for you to stand on your feet and say, my God. Listen again. You can't maintain a habit without a spirit to support it. If you're going to have a holy habit, you got to have a Holy Spirit. To maintain an unholy habit, you got to have an unholy spirit. Come on, shout this with me. If the habit ain't holy, Neither is the spirit behind it. Okay, I'm closing. Whew. That that's why, as a parent, if I say I love my children. I got to teach them holy habits. Because if they learn from me an unholy habit, I become responsible for the habitation of demons in their life and that becomes their stronghold and that will destroy them. That's why as matured Christians and believers in church, all of us should be partnering to make sure our youth don't develop unholy habitations. You can't just take that lightly when you see a child or a kid doing the wrong thing. They are establishing a habitation for demons. And here's what the devil tells you. They're just going, they're just, they're just yawn. Okay, let me give you this example. I'm done. I'm going to my seat. Hear me good. I'm being very transparent. How many of y'all are old enough to remember young men just got to sow their wild oats? Who heard that? That is as ignorant. Yeah. 
That's grown folk giving boys permission to establish an unholy habit which sets up an unholy habitation of demonic spirits, which is why they can't be faithful to a wife when they get married. That's why the number one cause of divorce is infidelity. You can't sow wild oats without producing wild results. So I don't care how sincere he is at the altar saying I do, he can't. Because he has a portal and a stronghold while he puts the ring on the finger. We got the point now where we give our girls the same permission. I'm just talking honest with y'all before I close. I, 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 I'm 60 years into this. Let me tell you something. I know the influence of my life as a young pastor who taught me wrong. I said to my children yesterday at the table, that I, what would you do different? I regret, I had to repent because God sent a few people early in my life who was trying to tell me some right stuff and I resisted it. Because I had other models who would let me get away with anything. Because their model was messed up. They messed my model up. They had shiny cars, big houses, nice suits with bad lifestyles. One day I picked up Dr. Tony Evans from the airport. He was coming to speak, and I was honored to go pick him up. I was young, I was in my 20s. He didn't know me, I didn't know him. I just listened to him on the radio, 105.7 KACB. Got him in the car, driving him to the church, 20-minute ride. He instantly started asking me very personal questions about my lifestyle. I took offense. How can this man get in my car? I'm giving him a ride. He does not know me, and he's in my business. I didn't like it. But God had put that man in my car. And he was interested enough in me as a young minister to spend those 20 minutes giving me some very holy advice. And I rejected it. The next time I see him, I'm going to let him know I had to repent. Because had I listened to that man, it would have saved me a whole lot of anguish. What he was really asking me is, do you have any unholy habitations in your mind? It wasn't going to benefit him one way or the other. He didn't need me. He already had his stuff. What God had to bring me to to understand that wherever there is going to be life there's got to be love wherever there is love there's law and when you are a kingdom leader you've got to elevate kingdom law to the point that it changes your behavior because it's whatever your behavior is affects those you say you love and that's why most of us have damaged the people we love. Because we've been leading according to the wrong principles. We hurt our children, our grandchildren, 
our churches, our jobs, our legacies until we understand this. What's your decision? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back. To God be the glory. <laughs>